Salutations, everyone, and welcome back to the Economy Mod for Hearts of Iron 4. I'm your host, Mr. TNO Lover, but we got to talk about who watches the Watchmen. President Kennedy's laying, lays in his bed, staring at the ceiling as his wife right beside him, one of those va vacuous, vacuous Victorian romances she loves so much. He was thinking about cages. It was Harry Truman, he recalled, who had once called the White House the finest prison in the world. He wasn't far off from the truth there. All across America. Right, the second millions of people were behind bars, some of them destined for the electric chair, and plenty of them should have never been there in the first place. Everyday prisoners were beaten or abused and had their basic rights withheld from them. And this thought the president is what we call justice. He had to do something. America's run justice system hung over its head like the sword of Damocles. Swaying to and fro, and he knew he would be free of its infernal presence until he scoured the taint of justice from America. Tomorrow would begin working on a bill to reform America's prisons and, and their cruel, discriminatory, and unjust practices. Hanging there, fellow, he thought, as he drifted off to sleep. It won't be this way for much longer. I do. Parts of Chip 101. President Kennedy tapped furiously at his tire pressure, stopping only to sip from his glass of scotch at his side, the ice having long ago melted. Kennedy vigorously poured his thoughts onto the page in a stream of consciousness, knowing that the interns who wrote his speeches would t clean it up later. It was a fiery and passionate speech, as all of his speeches have been lately. Filled with rhetoric and calls to action, Kennedy was tired of having to cow to the riots in the party, but as he paused to have a belt of scotch, he wondered if perhaps he could stand it or rein it in a bit, throwing the right wingers a bone. They were priority brothers after all, and he couldn't control Congress without him. Despite the progressive dominance, big names like Easton, Thurman, and Wallace still drew voters of the party like Moths Moth to a Flame or a Zapper. Brown and Kennedy debated within himself that it would be wise to make a speech to reassure the right wingers. Obviously, he couldn't give them any real concessions, but perhaps it was a good idea to change his language, scale back the bombast, and assure him his plans for civil rights wouldn't be extreme as they feared. Sipping, Kennedy leaned back in his chair, furrowing his brow, his brain dragged him one way or another, and his heart another. Or his dragged his brain one way, and his heart another. Heart wants what a heart wants. The brain knows best. And uh, stamp out the hate, flames of hate. It has been an oft-observed irony that present laws is freedom of speech. Often protect those whose very nature seems that free speech is a sham. The unwavering blindness of late justice lawmen. The, oh, look at that. Um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, the lawmen argue that all speech, no matter how hateful or spotful towards the rights of others, must be placed under equal protection. Thus, one may find hate mongers staying atop their soapboxes and radio towers, questioning why their victims should enjoy the very rights they're using to browbeat them into submission. So far, this has gone on for far too long. Either these malcontents stick to the spirits of free speech rather than abuse its words to their fullest extent, or they shall find themselves bereft of any speech at all. Sheathing the sort of Damocles. Times come to draft a prison reform bill to the end of horrific injustice faced every day by America's convicts. Serving a sentence doesn't disqualify man from having the same basic rights and protections guaranteed to every American. It's about time that moves from the realm of ideals into reality. We can't let any human penal colonies be run in America, but at the same time, changing such an entrenched institution overnight will be far from easy. Instead of going all in, we can instead issue some more moderate reforms to fix the major problems and try and deal with the prison slow and steady. We can also preserve our political capital by issuing token reforms that our opponents could hardly oppose without looking over, uh, overly draconian. But will that really do any good? Facts that injustice in America's prisons wants to be remedied. The only question that remains is how strong we should make the dose. No compromise? A moderate? Or no compromise? Dragon's teeth? There'll be no compromises. President Kennedy sat behind his desk, chin on hand, listening to Thurman sharply criticize him and everything he stood for over the phone. Thurman had a way of delivering the most unpleasant insults, so that uh, didn't sound like insults at all. Since he picked up his receiver to find Thurman on the other end, Kennedy had received quite a few of them. Underneath the sort of faux pas, or faux politeness, Kennedy could tell that Thurman was absolutely livid about the most recent speech he could give in support of civil rights. The anger of the right wingers had been growing for a while under President's irritation, and this had been, apparently been the straw that broke the camel's back. He could feel Thurman's ra fury radiating through the telephone like a beam of radiation directly into his brain, as ever. Kennedy said as little as possible to avoid aggravating Thurman further. The less material fuel in the fire that of old Carolina devil, the better. Suddenly, Thurman changed tack. You ever heard of the story of Jason and the dragon's teeth, Mr. President? Without waiting for a response, seemingly knowing he had Kennedy off his guard, Thurman continued to Jason looking for that golden fleece. I had to plant some dragon teeth in the earth like seeds. Only when he did, the teeth sprouted into unholy warriors who attacked him on sight. There's a moral of the story. Baba, you reap what you sow. That's a message you'll do well to keep in mind. As Kennedy drew breath to respond, the phone clicked as Thurman hung up on him. So he pulled his phone back on the hook. It had been a while since Bobby had read the classes, but he seemed to remember Jason winning in the end. Of course, without his memory returned, he had to pay a terrible price for it. Plant evil seeds, get evil crops. Clemency goes, though watch word from certain members of the MPP these days. Savvy and careful at the same time, flawlessly shifting between assuring President Kennedy that the most assured condone his actions and urging for a more moderate approach in handling the rot, more often than not within the same breath. They cloud themselves in propriety and restraint of law and order and fairness, contrasting themselves in the swift and righteous justice when they, they see as crude and un-American. So do they pair old President Lincoln's words for all Americans to come together and bind the nation's wounds? Any doctor worth their degree will tell you that many wounds. Without cleaning them only to invite disease and decay. So, uh, bringing slow ruin to the body within, ever has the racism of our southern has been the metastasizing tumors of dear Columbia's bosom. 
As all good doctors should, therefore, it is our duty to exercise them before stitching their sutures so that they may begin mending. For this task, our moderates have been shown to be obstacles and impediments to hindering good doctors' pace. President Kennedy believes an ultimatum will suffice in either bringing these meteors to heal or allowing them to exit their post with, with grace. Don't rain on my parade. Once again, of course, the abominable American or Arizona Senator, Barra Goldwater, um, has come forth to try to ruin all of our hard work. Um, despite our President Farm Bill having support from the power blocks in the Congress, including the Democrats, Goldwater has made a public show of his opposition to it. He seems like he'll protest any legislation put forward, no matter what it is. He's trying out the usual arguments of states' rights, calling us undemocratic for imposing new laws and order standards federally, rather than leaving up to the states. Do one experience politics, Goldwater is clearly trying to position himself as a tough, on, tough law and order politician to the public, most likely to preamble a preamble as an intro 68, even though it's already 1970. Goldwater is president. There's a sober and thought. Thankful for the time being, is powerless to prevent the cause of justice and our bill sail through the Congress, making the prison reforms law. Thousands of unjustly treated convicts will now experience a greater quality of life and have access to the same rights as every other American. And no thanks, to Bert Goldwater. Deal with it, Barry. We get rehabilitation, huh? And no more penal labor. We get work programs. All right, stat state of injustice will improve. Oh, crashes and burns. Still got this too, huh? Well, where are we at? Still get plus three. It's still not too bad, but still. Elections? Let's not talk about elections. If elections were fair, they wouldn't let us vote. Fly for fury. The Midwest is best described as a flat, empty land where people are born, buried alive, and spend their lives doing little but wiling their lives away as the corn grows and the rain of the years erodes on them. The hills. As people are almost fanatically proud of the wholesome Americana, their unchanging pastoral lives, they have souls of clay ready to be molded by the next charismatic stranger with a suitcase in his hand and a smile on his face. It's their very plasticity that makes Midwesterners politically dangerous. A crucial battleground in every election, the pendulum of the Midwest can make a break presence, their allegiance aligned from candidate to candidate like the swinging of a metronome. I'll do this one too, because why not? Unfortunately, it appears as though the favors of the Midwest have swung thoroughly in Goldwater's direction over the last few weeks. He's been turning around the Midwest giving speeches at town halls against the president, a particular focus being our recent prison reform bill, which Goldwater has presented to his malleable audiences and is being weak on crime and prayless to his idyllic existence they hold dear. Oh boy. Goldwater managed to soak the reliably gullible Midwesterners into a fury. Protests have been held against our reforms in almost every major city in the region as Midwestern sentiment towards the president's hours. We can all hope that the infamously changeable Midwest will swing back to our side sooner we may find ourselves in trouble. What is he, the Pied Piper? Further divided. Both are updated. Oh, that was supposed to get worse for us, but we got better. We gained five instead of four or three. Law and order. Ask any bitter cynic about American justice a year ago, and they all unabashedly spoke of its hypocrisies and the measures they had caused the war to those that swore to protect. The perverse and corrupting touch of racism had caressed it since the nation's founding, hence failing to unleash its otherwise heavy blows towards slave masters old and new. Nothing will change it, they have lamented, so misfortune the American black has been, is, and will be. Fast forward a year later, a campaign against the Dixie Crats under their beloved Jim Crow seemed to much change in the shape of American lawmaking. Silver rights now flow freely from the marble dome card houses, where puppet judges once enforced edicts of barely concealed hate. Policemen now patrol the streets without regard for the criminal skin color. Gravel now punctuate fair verdicts for all Americans as if their we don't know where's Lady Justice's blindfolds in every trial. Ask a better cynic a year ago that things will change and one will only be responded with their spiteful laughs of hopeless men. So are we behooved to reach out to them and give them hope until we prove them wrong. Those who burn crosses. They wear no badges, no armbands. By the day, they go without masks on weekend nights to get together the tradesmen, the teachers, the shopkeepers, and they dove, doff the white robes and painted hoods and meet on the hills above town. They drag towards the man with the wrong skin color who is seen talking to the wrong girl and they hang him high. He watches those fans face the specters through tear washed eyes as his lungs gasp and the throat collapses. He is left swinging in the light of morning. They are the Triple K, the ghosts of the regime that died hundred years before. Or go, stubbornly refusing to give the archaic beliefs of their forebears the Triple K and pass the southern states. Like a plague of termites in a rotten house, burrowing into state governments and institutes to spread their influence. Once they've taken hold, they pump their filth into the minds and hearts of southerners, ever growing like a tumor. It's time that something be done about these mass cowards. We need to break their influence and take back the south, but it won't be easy. If we don't do this with, with finesse, we'll likely spark civil descent across the south and have to endure a political strap in Washington if it looks like we're targeting the Klan because they have different beliefs to us. We could try drafting to build a banner mile right, or we could be uh, going under the table. Either way, they won't like it to, uh, take it lying down. Ban the Klan? Probably could do that. Back channel, huh? Just ban him. See what we can do. Redress of grievances. Writing a bill is easy, but getting it through is tough, especially when a Congress is packed. With reactions will filibuster anything that at least even slightly progresses. 
Well, I don't think you really say that right now. To get this pass, our enemies will need to draft this perfectly and get over any reward to make sure there's as little excitement to them as possible. We can't facilitate forever. The time's coming to get down to the brass tacks, keeping in mind. Uh, the First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech and association. Do we want to rip out the loopholes and ban the clan outright? Or try to drive them underground and set and save ourselves to flying in Congress? Deal dealable evil. Make them illegal. We'll see what we can do. Um, try that, maybe. Ah, more prisons, please. No deficit in my America. No, it's thunder. A ban on the Triple K has been a pure and mitigated disaster. Not only has it failed to stop the now, there are now illegal activities. So now to be a complete unenforceable southern police, mostly clan members of themselves, refuse to break up clan meetings and arrest known leaders. Clan affiliates have been arrested, screaming themselves, hoarse on almost every radio station that broadcasts south of the Mason Dixon. Free speech rallies have been held in major several several major southern cities, and the cheer on the top of this Sunday. We're getting whipped at which every way in Washington by the Democrats and the rioters in our own party. And the Republicans aren't too keen on it. Make matters worse, if that's possible, the Klan's planning a huge rally atop Stone Mountain of Georgia, where they're going to burn a gigantic wooden cross that'll be visible all over Atlanta. We've no choice but to send in the army to watch over the gathering and keep the peace, but even that will leave law and order teetering on a nice edge. If this goes wrong, the South could end up like a pile of dry wood struck by lightning. We can only hope this doesn't turn out ugly. When their backs are against the wall, men who burn the symbol of their worship are liable to burn anything. I smell smoke in the wind. As I'm drinking a cup of coffee, the Stone Mountain Massacre. Let's unclear who shot first. Before the cross had even been lit, tensions were high atop Stone Mountain. Turned out several times what we expected, and our troops were massively outnumbered by clan members, both masked and unboldly masked, many armed. A single sudden shot was all it took to light the power of keg, and Stone Mountain erupted into sudden horrific violence as our troops opened fire on the crowd, and the clan's been followed too. About time the shooting stopped. And the smoke had cleared. Twenty five bodies lay beneath this mountain, or smoldered and crossed on the mountain top. Four soldiers and twenty one civilians, all suspected clansmen. Their wives and uh, daughters weep on TV screens all over America. The South is ready to explode. And the rest of the country is much better. People are in an uproar over what they see as the government murdering people who are protecting or protesting against or breaking the First Amendment. Weirdo demagogues ask who the, whom the Yankee hit squads will go after next. Um, Neil says, bad for us. Goldwater, Thurman, and the Owls are screaming red face in Congress, and there's not a newspaper or news program in the nation to honor right side right now. Even many of our science political allies are distancing themselves from us. But right now, the country's in shock, and all we can do is hope that it fades quickly, but sitting alone in his unit. Uh, unlit office and thinking of his murdered brother, the president has a bad feeling that Stone Mountain Massacres are calling. Will say his legacy for like nicotine. Tears flow like the Mississippi. Law and order. Dream deferred. Yeah. We'll see how it affects us. Rain Hoover in. Every political in the Beltway, from lowly staffers to beloved presidents, learned to watch it back from J. Edgar Hoover. If I was infamous director, Hoover's been. Uh, has both the means in the world to quit every single skeleton in an unlucky man's call allows it. Those unfortunate enough to have gained his hour refused it was once to see their careers brought to an ignominious end by scandalous bombshells leaked to the press by concerned citizens, such as the chilling chair of men who considered the kingmaker of Washington, D.C. President Kennedy cannot be counted so easily, however untouchable he may be, but the director has just as many skeletons as any old statements. Statement. With proper planning and the right people, we may be able to catch him with his own trap. Getting arguably America's greatest supply master on our side as a stable weapon be a great boon to the longevity of the president's agenda, despite the risks involved. No compromises. Guy grimaced, watching the president from the cameras. To put it mildly, looked like crap. Stressed out of his mind from finagling the party's segregationist harpies, Bobby barely got a lick of sleep in the past three days. Even the best makeup artists in Washington couldn't hide it. Outwardly stoic, Guy wanted to bury his head in the sands. Every time the cameras cut back to Bobby, he got angry and hairy like a gosh darn werewolf. Crushed somebody who was sweating like Nixon. There will be absolutely no compromise on civil rights, exclaimed the president vigorously. Also, while looking like he'd faint any second, my administration is 100% committed to equal rights for every American. Lady Jim Crow must end, America's better. We're better than this to hold people in contempt for nothing more than the color of the skin. Ah, oh, crap, that guy is going off the script. Any American who denies his fellow for his race, continued the president, is an enemy of the National Progressive Pact and, above all, an enemy of America itself. Guy wanted to bomb right there in the White House press room. Things were rocking with Thurman and Wallace's gang, and it's going to make it a whole lot worse. You wonder if this phone was really ringing off the hook. Still, this sort of thing electrified the blacks. Clenched his jaw, Guy prayed that America's newly enfranchised African Americans would make themselves heard at the polling booths. Compromise is a stalling between two fools. Pretty much. Pretty, pretty much. Um, 1.14 billion, my god. Was it updated? Oh boy, let's take a look at it now. now. Oh, that's not good. Now we're only plus three, but that's yeah, still better than nothing, though. 11.54%.
Good God, does it cost us? We do that, and we barely get anything here, so there's no, no point even in doing that. Um, dangerous progressive. That's not good. Yeah, that's not good at all. But the world's still looking okay-ish. Well, except these guys. They're looking like crap over here. But that's okay with us. Israel. The Jewish state by Begin. Begin? Bring them in. But Turkey's looking pretty thick, though. Pretty thick. And what do we have over here? Different. Nope. Alright. Their investigation. Damn the police force. A dream deferred. Anthony Thomas sat with his heart in his mouth as his little sister cried her eyes out on his family's tastefully unholstered, upholstered couch. Telling him how a group of white boys stopped their bikes to yell at her as she walked home from school. They threw stones at her and said African Americans weren't welcome in the neighborhood. Then one of them spat in her face and they all pedaled away laughing. Anthony remembered. Hearing about that senator from Washington coming to town, how he'd given some kind of speech. It seemed to have made the tensions in Milwaukee even more strained than they already were. On the radio, they were saying there would be riots in Detroit and Des Moines. Why is intimidating black students and breaking the windows of black owned businesses? It seemed like the president was trying to make things better for them, but with everything he did, he should have been a good, had the opposite result. Should have been good, had the opposite result. The president meant well, but the White House was far removed from the turmoil unfolding in the streets. Anthony had hardly forgotten what he'd come home from school to break through the window. His father's crestfallen look, the smiles of the white devil, somehow wider as if they knew, as if they cheered his silent rage. Anthony felt his hands clasped into fists so tight it made his knuckles pale. What kind of brother was he if he couldn't even protect his own sister? He knew he couldn't rely on the authorities. Anthony felt his heart resolve harden. He knew he'd grow up and fast and was changing, but there would always be those who would hate him for the color of his skin. But when they came, he'd be ready. He'd wipe out their smiles one by one. Oh, Ohio. What a god darn state. Examine the police force. To protect and serve so who has a frame. Ideally, the dual matters of those who serve and who, those who protect should not be addressed. The quality of service and protection is a sin qua non for a government agency, to our shame. America's officers take advantage of the model's good faith to display selectivity, supposed to say in its implementation. The prejudice of our police forces presents not merely a moral quandary any good man should overcome, but a scattering of thorns deeply embedded within the body politic, sending it shooting pains throughout the country as it attempts to grow freely. An examination is long overdue, and like any good doctor, must adhere to our oath and do our best to root these thorns out. The is still getting worse. It's still not looking great. It's only going down because our GDP keeps increasing by 7%, which is not bad in theory, but still. Their investigation? Trolling of the bridge. Nobody said reforming. Well, the nation would be easy, but it would be a whole lot less painful if our own employees were actively scheming against us. Easing the FBI's or their own personal army of spies, Swiffer's become one of the most powerful and feared men of the country, covertly infiltrating government organizations all across America, allegedly amassing a huge quantity of blackmail material, and carrying out clan and standing off in illegal operations. In essence, they're a shadow government within the government, infesting our institutions like dormant tuberculosis bacteria just waiting for the conditions to be right for them to awaken. It's gotta stop. Though it should be our obedient, uh, obedient underling, Hoover has effectively become a rogue spy master with an unprecedented level of power and clout, and his interests are very often at odds with their own. He's far too entrenched in the FBI to be effectively neutralized, but perhaps we can give him a bit of his own medicine to get a leash on him and stop his unethical operations. There have been some unseemly rumors, unseemly rumors about Hoover by his longtime protege, Clyde Tolson, floating around for decades involving his all male partisan and furlative visits from handsome young men in the middle of the night. Hoover may like dirty tricks, but two can play at that game. Let's find his closet open and see what the skeletons fall out. Everyone must be brought to you. Miraculously, Hoover has agreed to cooperate with the Kennedy administration. There remains a bevy of work to do before we can rest on our laurels. But uh, for however now, we can put it, uh, our ally to good use. Since the day we lost the Second World War, support for the fascist menace has unfortunately risen in our own shores. Instead of upswing in the membership of the groups such as the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, and the formation of movements which share the same viewpoints, there are menace on not only the black population of the South, in which they have both large presence and widespread support, but also lawmen who attempt to enforce their laws. In short, fascist paramilitaries are running around the South, causing havoc for the government and some people, but there, there's anyone who can find all sorts of excuses to bring them down for good as Mr. Speed himself. Wow, we're looking really crappy now. Friend of Dorothy. Man of Hoover's, uh, look at that, uh, as well, often sad as have long graduated past the furthest of boy-on-boy touching in the board school and bedroom, and the shame should I groupings in public restrooms and carry on the clandestine affairs in luxury hotel rooms. It was one such plush, well appointed hotel that one of her Secret Service agents was able to snap a few choice photographs of Hoover and it's saying they were the protege of several decades and second in command, Tolson, in a room with only one bed. Even more interestingly, we got some pictures of Hoover and Tolson meeting with a pair of handsome young men in the hotel barn taking them up to the room. All I have to do is a little bit of digging and all of a sudden you're turning up yellow skeletons all over the place. Dig up the yellow brick road and who knows what you'll find. 
The extras of Hoover, huh? Still not good for this spot, but you know, whatever. Uh, Mr. Facility is not bad. We're not going to be able to get it probably that much higher, though. 115, huh? Not enough. Jimmy's like, no, nah, we're not going to give you anything here. Oh, he's singer, huh? The Burgundian Inheritance, my god. And how's, how's it Bowman? How's Bowman doing? Those who work forces. Despite pledging to serve and protect American, every American citizen, it's an open secret that racism taints the police departments of America like black mold or plaster. Unfortunately, the career on the police force appears to attract the kind of people that have regressive views and enjoy using the powers to beat down people they don't like and anyone who looks at them sideways while well, do it. And the task of approval from the brass doesn't help matters. Every week or so, more reports come in of black people being harassed, wrongfully arrested, being yes killed by policemen in cities all across the nation. This epidemic of racist violence against Af American citizens by the men who are being paid to protect them must be stopped. Uh, this morning, President Kennedy gave a speech at Capitol virtually denouncing a virulently denouncing the systematic racism of law enforcement and promising to root out the un-American racists entrenched within the nation's police. Thurman responded by calling the president a witch hunter in the Senate, but can't let the craggy old lizards in Washington stop us, we'll stop us in just whatever it takes. Another system be fixed and watching the watchmen. All we want to, to believe there are men and women in our community who uphold the law and nothing else, and who doesn't want to think that they can't turn in the neighborhood beat cop or the local sheriff to ensure justice is done. But for the longest time, those agents of law have allowed some of the worst injustices in the country to go on, from the draconian South Sheriff to the hate filled Northern Police Officer. We can never have justice so long as those who enforce the law often violate it. And we can never rely on the fellow officers to call them out, they would rather turn a blind eye rather than actually do their duty. Uh, well, they won't have that burden any longer. The Department of Justice is going to have to give them a new burden instead, watching municipal and county police are prosecuting them for any crimes they commit in their communities. And everyone's going to know if there's a new sheriff in town. So a change of air. Since we put a leash on Hoover, our agents have been necessarily tearing through the FBI's file to figure out what exactly they've been up to. And surprise, surprise, it's not just sunshine and rainbows. From the records that may remain, it appears that Hoover has even been using the FBI's own personal army and sending, extra, sending agents to acquire a blackmail material on important figures and extrajudicially pursuing suspected criminals. Among the less shocking stuff, in a number of redacted files, are agents have uncovered evidence of a secret program called COINTELPRO. We don't have all the facts so far, but it appears to be an intelligence gathering program focused on someone vaguely chose enemies of the state nation, most notably civil rights leaders. But uh, Hoover apparently authorized use of illegal tactics to get, gather information on these people and harass them into silence and inaction. Needless to say, that's a complete and total violation of this victim's rights and subversion of everything President Kennedy stands for. Let's send a drag Hoover into the Oval Office and have a rather serious chat with him. The cat's out of the bag, man. The cat is out of the bag. But what are we doing next? Oh, we have the oil crisis. If you wondered about these, please go right ahead. I think I read this before, so uh, we're running on fumes. It's not good for us. But we're America, so we, in theory, should not be running on fumes, but you never know. And we're just going to go ahead and kill all these divisions off up here. Um, and the answer to violence is with violence. Now, the air sat still muggy in the Roosevelt rooms. Many of the men sitting around the table rolled up their sleeves and loosened their ties. Kennedy's chair creaked back to look at each of them in turn. However, Hoover, guy, key members of his cabinet, turned out to the aides, clustered around the wall, and asked him to leave. When he was alone with the most trusted underlings, as well as Hoover began. Mr. Hoover was so far to discuss the principles and functions of the COINTEL program, and for now I'm letting you off the hook. The president hoped Hoover would be visibly show sure relief, but he just sat there blankly like an old McCad. However, it strikes me that it would be a colossal waste of resources to simply cancel the program. But I got some odd looks from Guy and others. Hoover narrowed his eyes and more praise. Well, Kennedy continued, it has occurred to me that with minimal difficulty, this program could be repurposed to investigate certain reactionary elements that oppose the goals and ideals of this administration. Including the enemies of justice within the party. Everyone in the room looked taken aback. Guy stared at the president open mouth and surprised, internally furious. Kennedy hadn't consulted him before him. Hoover, after a moment of inaction, smiled knowingly, of course, Mr. President, why would it hardly take any time at all? All you gotta do is drive me a list. His toad like grin stretched out from his every wrinkle. Kennedy nodded blankly, very good, Mr. Hoover, we'll be in touch soon, thank you everyone. Extreme problems require extreme solutions. Oh boy. Making a deal with a FBI devil. Um, I think I read this before, so if you want to read on Empires, please go right ahead. So, they spend the rest of the walk at home in silence. So, our investments in the Middle East will grow. Um, I got a lot of Germans here, don't they? Not sure if I like that. Too many Germans here. So, we're just going to go here, here, and circle all these divisions and kill them pretty much all off. So, at least that's the plan. Nice. Ooh, you can't quit when they can you? But also, if that's oh, man, they sound a lot of divisions, didn't they? Good. 
Running on fumes, pretty normal. Happy December, everybody. I knew the oil crest would hit eventually, but whatever. Um, set the prices. Well, if you want to read about all these, please go right ahead. I those crests will be reduced, which would be good. Um, we'll just get through all this at the Federal Energy Office, of course. Remember that, please go ahead as well. Set the prices. Enforce rationing. A, a synthetic alternative, which is pretty nice, too. And disaster, disaster averted? A momentary embolism? Well, we'll see. As Here's also our economy for now, as well. We're going to always spend more money. Like, that's what we're always going to do, but... That's not bad, and we're almost half a trillion in the GDP. The price of fairness. You know, Robert, Kennedy almost imperceptibly wins. The rage of his VP barely is keeping from the muted tone. Uh, both men having sat across from each other in the Oval Office when we investigated Hoover's den and Vipers. I was expecting us to take off his fingers from everyone's paws, not give him executive permission to do it at your own whim. We need man fire back, guy. And what? By what? Slicing or sicking of the FBI and whoever we don't bloody like, Bobby? And you would prefer living every moment in fear of Thurman and the bloody Dixies? Robert exploded, standing up from his seat, his gaze and eyes brimming with fury. You were there with me from the beginning, and you know this road wasn't going to be clean. We can just stand on our moral high ground and pretend the opposition is not pulling strings every moment to deny us every inch of victory. We, Robert's gaze softened his expression. Mutually relaxed from fury and outrage to a sorrowful, guilty expression. I can't. I can't fail them too, Gary. I can't fail America. Uh, the sounds in the room stretched for a long minutes before the scraping of the sound of a chair indicated that his VP stood up and has left the room with a simple sentence, but one that all that branded the president's heart with a hot iron. John is dead, Robert, so stop living for a dead man's sake. Oh boy. Now, uh, Chris the price, of course, still, but we still have to get down through here, too. Of course, I read this one last time as well, but beating the southern bullies. Seasons change and crisis come and pass, both barren stormy winds that do away with facades to unveil the true hearts of men. Such. Uh, has undoubtedly been the case in America. In recent years, as the NPP continues, the onwards march to deliver freedom and equality, uh, want true freedom and equality in this country. Uh, with all that has happened, is it really a surprise that the winds of stormy change have revealed the Dixiecrats' hearts and found a rotting, fe uh, fetid organ? Long have we disavowed them from what should be, our, uh, should be in his becoming a party of progress, yet the presence lingers in the home states, ready to impede the federal government from enforcing its own laws in every step of the way. A party of vipers, through and through, perhaps okay, can only be handled as vipers should be? Decisions to investigate certain leaders will be unlocked. New routines for police duty offenses. The president said along a note this afternoon to all state police directors regardless, regarding procedures and routines for handling cases where police officers get reported for inappropriate conduct, both illegal actions and behavior contra contra contrary to a police code. For too many years, have police officers been allowed to take a break for six months while recovering them and come back to the force as if nothing had ever happened? For even more serious cases, earlier retirements have been the norm it's not, and it was never okay. It's a custom that systematically gives police officers the freedom to exercise their power beyond their mandate. It pardons police officers who accidentally shoot innocent people and even worse crimes. He had to send a clear message to the police in our nation that such action will no longer be tolerated. The note. Was linked to the press and progressives across the country celebrating the president's clear voice in such matters. Republican Democrat voters are more skeptical as conservatives and the Democrats argue that the president should not interfere in the judicial branch. Or that the president should keep his <clears throat> excuse me, powers limited to executive domain. The Republicans on the other hand are more concerned with how this might limit police efficiency. The results of Kenny's routines are of course yet to be seen and may be the good despite. Uh, any criticism? This should get them in shape. Saturday Night Massacre. We will have the will of the people, they do not. We have the will. We must bend the arc of the universe for justice no matter what happens. Long term, short term. Uh, everyone by this, please go ahead. We'll take a chance with war. Swift warfare. Protect track warfare. Well, let's do swift warfare right now. Oh, where's the capital? These guys are cut off, which is good. Oh, uh, they do have some tanks over here. We are fighting in Iran. All the other places we did win, so. Oh, look at that lag. A happy June 1st, 1971. And... Are they gone? They're not in position. A young, head, a young man loosened his tie and discreetly tried to get some uh, air down his sweat soaked shirt as the speakers on stage continued to drone on and on. Some nonsense about the supposed decline on the nation. He was not pleased when he received this assignment, aside from all the odious company with him which he now found himself. As a Connecticut boy, his blow was far too thick for Mississippi, so he could see why the boss considered these groups a priority. There seemed to be dozens of more every meeting. He wondered how, every, how these, many of these men burned crosses. He was surprised to see how easy he was in any way of himself within Yaki's followers. Apparently all he had to do was quote spangle and throw around a couple of racial epithets and you're in. Now is in the perfect place to start setting up operations to remove his fellow agents to the key positions within Yaki's hate groups. Hearing his name, fake though it was, the red-haired man directed his head to the speaker on stage. It was being called up their friend from, from, from north. He made his way to the podium to thunder his applause and unfolded his speech, quoting 
Written in Quantico, he thought. But they don't even know that. Taking a deep breath, imagining himself one day sitting behind Hoover's desk, the young man began, My friends, we must reverse the decline of the nation. A fox in a hen house. There you go. Just here to kill up all enemy divisions. Could go the other way and actually destroy them all that way. But oh, there you go. Not bad. Beating the Southern bullies, Gene Kirkpatrick and Georgetown. As Gene Kirkpatrick ascended the steps, the crowds unfolded before. She couldn't begin to count how many there were. It had to be been in the thousands. Countless blue flags tore a and blazing upon them were the waving in Guinea's wind. A deafening roar came to them. The words. Overlapping and jumbled, but not impossible to make out. Her name was being chanted. That they could tell. She could tell. As a word, such as freedom, democracy, in America. Congresswoman Kirkpatrick finally reached the top of the podium and began to address the people before. She'd given the speech a hundred times before she could do it in her sleep by now. Promise about ensuring, protecting, and expanding democracy flowed from her lips like water, and the crowd were spun as they always did a strong, near deafening cheer. She swore that the U.S. could be doing more in the fight against fascism, and she preached that the best way to do that was through the Organization of Free Nations. Georgetown listened and threw the miracles of the camera. Washington, D.C. listened. As it can bear in Ottawa and more cities than she could count. Cities all over the world, those in nations that flew the Organization of Free Nations blue flag proudly next to their own, listened to Kirk Congresswoman Kirkpatrick. Some endeavor about the speech hour. Both Kirkpatrick and everyone listening could tell, it was difficult to pinpoint exactly a sense of urgency, perhaps? A new found purpose? There was now a new edge to Kirkpatrick's words, like a fine blade that had been hard and sharp, and by the end of her speech, it became quite clear where this edge had come from. She took a breath. It is this end that I decided to run for president in 1972, for the defense and development of uh, uh, democracy both here and abroad. The bonfire roared. Brothers of War, Kenny declared at the cross across the desk at Guy and Clark. Clark was leaning forward, jabbing the air with his finger while Guy sat back and inscrutably silent. Unucking unbelievable, continued Clark, ruby face and spittle mouth. At the last gosh darn month, there may be a bunch of segregationist races, obstructions, confederates, but the writers are our party brothers. Guy clapped back on his chair, exhausted, Christ sakes, Bob, we hate him as much as you do, but we should be focused on reducing the influence of the party. Now going after them with the failings of spies, but that, like for second coming of Nixon. Clark slumped back, painting and puffing. Guy sat and leaned forward. Looking, listen, Bobby, I'll keep this brief. Ramsey and I just can't be part of this. It's an insult to democracy and the Constitution. I went to you first as a friend. Went to you first. Now you make me come to you as a vice president. This is a formal complaint. Kenny slammed his fist down on the desk, ceiling full of vitriol. Guy narrowed his eyes. Kenny had been flying off the handle more and more lately than when he was challenged. Do, do you two, began Kennedy, barely keeping his raging check, know who you're talking to? I'm the gosh darn president. I have no choice. This has to be done if we want to keep Thurman and Eastland's minions in check. We can't keep waiting until we starve them out. They would do the same thing to us. He raised his arms above him and stared up immediately at an immaculately whitewashed ceiling. It's not a crime, it's justice. Silence reigned in the room, and Bob wasn't sure who said it. Who said the line that burned a fire in his spirit who had led him to two, and led him to consider what was once two friends of the highest traders of America. Something that him died when he called Hoover. But all I could remember is the rage of sentences and soda in him. Jack would be so disappointed in you. Attorney General has gone public. Her eyes have been silenced. Oh boy. Silence the Attorney General. Oh boy. The fall. No matter the nationalists. We can take another John Birch Society. Well, maybe we don't want to do that one, but you know it is what it is. In the meantime, I think we're in treaty ports too. Manrieda. Uh, if you heard about these, please go right ahead. I've read these before, so I'm not super concerned about it. Being the beast. Uh, cogs in the machine. Pump the gas. Rosie the Operator. Fun well, Skunk Works. And ready for battle. Don't forget what happened to Robespierre. Robert Kennedy poured himself a finger of scotch. Downed it, poured another. He walked behind his desk and slumped heavily into his chair. It had all been going so well as Hoover's boys were making sure Yaki got what he deserved, and the reactions on the right of the party finally had been most silent. Even Thurman, that anti justice effort, had been kept quiet, but now he was being attacked by the man closest to him, the men who were supposed to be his ally. Guy had been repeatedly voicing his concerns with the use of the FBI to silence the enemies of the progress. Of progress. And those of you low concern, it was getting louder, harder to ignore was Ramsey Clark. The man Kennedy himself had raised from obscurity to the lofty position of Attorney General. Both of them rejected the ongoing call Intel Pro program. Who should claim that it was totally unethical and eroded the essential freedoms of all Americans? Neither of them could be trusted. Was everyone on his side turning from the cause of justice? Was it Rob Spear who said you couldn't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs? Did they really think their ideals could, ideals could be getting, or their, or could be realized without getting their hands dirty? The president's hand sat around the glass. For the greater good, Clark needed to be signed. Something had to be done. Give Hoover a call. We have time to fix some evidence. Give Hoover a call. The Fox has many tricks. As we were just kind of waiting here, hanging out, and they're trying to need a silence, these people. Ain't infiltrate them, huh? Hmm.
Kick in the fascist here, huh? Well, we could try. Four is not bad. 20.4% is still not bad. So slowly, slowly going down, but 0.23 is not too bad here either. Also, here's the Senate results as well. We actually lost this progressive. The Nationals have been pretty much been destroyed, but whatever. Uh, Fox has many tricks. President hung up uh, Hoover, he thought, is a loathsome little toe, but he cannot deny that the man had his uses. As usual, he could have pleased, but Kenny had been able to feel a slimy smile over the phone. He knew this would cost him. Every favor he got from Hoover gave the vile man grain more power over him. He had to be careful, but for now, this could be just what he needed. The FBI proved effective at harassing Yaki and the FRs. Sure, they could handle one mouthy lawyer. The only question is which dirty trick to try first. Send some heavies to the rough, got Clark, or grab a magazine, and cut the letters out, and send some scary letters. Pass me some pace on issues of women's on day. Of women's day. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, send the goons. The fall. He who fights monsters. Because I do want to get over here. Saturday Night Massacre. Bind up our wounds. Long as have we battled the specter of racism in the halls of Congress. The courts of law and the streets of asphalt. From all sides we've been struck and slowed. For to our front the dying husks of Jim Crow to our back. It sympathizes the kin of the coppers of old. Wearing the skin of progressivism no matter its flimsy transparent make. From side to side we're wastrels. Apathetic to the misery corrupting America's foundations from the inside out. Threatening to upend the comfort in which they live. We never want it. Neither did the throngs of huddled mass beneath us, or behind us, pouring blood, sweat, and tears into the dangerous fray for the slimiest chance to breathe. The free air will beloved country. Every right portion of brotherly love in the bleak days of revolution, al alloy with the brotherly blood in the horrible days of civil war. We upheld with every barricade appended, every dog headed racist ousted, every black brother and sister unchained. Now nothing is left of America's original sin save for the sputter choking gasps of the peculiar institutions misbegotten sudden in its backwaters. Yet, in another trial of error, or trial of fire, America seen itself battered, bruised, and bleeding, but un unbound still. Though fresh wounds marred skin, now is truly to mend, meet to mend, and heal it from as many ordeals it has faced. Air shot. If you think the FBI agents, after the years of intensive training, would be able to tell the difference between Ramsey Clark, Attorney General of the United States of America, and Ramsey Clark, uh, insurance salesman, you'd be wrong. They grabbed the poor dude off the street and beat him black and blue before they realized they were the wrong guy. For Christ's sake, he's 10 years younger than Clark and they don't even look alike. Now he's not in a hospital bed and throwing a suit. So the face, so I have to get the big payout to shut him up and keep out of his papers. Probably shouldn't try that again, but we gotta sign Clark as soon as possible. We can go back to the letter writing idea, or perhaps we can send Hoover's boys to tap his phone, see if we can record him saying something scandalous. So the pen's mightier than the sword. Hmm. Send Hoover's boys to tap the phones. Well, we'll see. Intimidate them. Oh boy. I don't know if I really want to do these right now. Intimidate them? Well, we'll see. If we fail, we fail. Be a bad way to end this campaign, but, you know, it is what it is. Pump the gas, of course. As we're always pumping. And the mercy of the telephone. Ramsey Clark's phone was among the most boring things known to man. The junior agent tasked with monitoring Clark's claws rude his misfortune. The worst in every lecture quantico I will ever dinner at the brother in law's house. So far today, Clark has made three calls on the most mundane of subjects imaginable. Unless the agent thinks, half asleep in the middle of the afternoon, that he speaks in some kind of code, doesn't seem likely. Another week of this, and he jumped into the Potomac. Why does people want the guy's phone's tap going by his calls? It's squeaky clean, nothing to see here. You know, things have to plant some evidence. Well, what we'll a tangled web we weave. There's no such thing a man without secrets. Everyone does something that others would consider shameful, and once the cat's out of the bag, there's a little chance of getting it back in. A scoundrel can destroy careers and ruin lives. Which is why, of course, what is what we just need. We get for can't sign some privately, we'll use that time, or time is coming to put Clark in the court of public opinion. Only the method remains. Should we take up the biggest, juiciest, nightest lie we can? Or should we send some agents to investigate his private life to see if there's something real we can dig up? It may seem like the world's most boring stuff, sure, but those tabs are often the ones who have the most skeletons in the closet. Catch him in the act. Hmm. Razzle Dazzle, maybe? 
Pump the gas. Cogs in the machine are next. But we'll see. It doesn't really affect much here. But if we do fail, well, that's not good. Oh. And influence society. First thing he knows about William Guy's is folks' Midwestern drawl. Make Kenny's forehead throb in the best of dreads, but after an hour of Guy screaming at him over the phone, he's in the throes of a hideous cluster headache. As Guy screeched about dirty tricks and due process, Kenny rubbed his aching forehead, felt like a diadem around his head, which kept tiny with every furious remonstrance. Apparently, one of Uber's latest incompetences got a guy instead of Kennedy to consult him. Well, the planner signed a clerk with an outrageous scan on Guy, irritatingly, irritatingly ethical dude that he is, almost immediately disavowed the plan and called the White House to yell about it. The president seems to have been able to convince Guy that it was Hooper's idea and he hadn't heard about it yet. But he knows he's going seriously on thin ice. One more F up and we're in serious stripe. Finally, they able to end the one sided tirade. Kennedy hung up, leaning back in his chair. He wondered how long it would take until Guy connected the dots between this and the use of the FBI to silence the reaction to the party. Kennedy yelled for his secretary to bring him an aspirin and dialed at Hoover's number, intent to fix his crisis and shut Clark up before this gets worse than it already is. He listened to the dial tone. Hoover loved to keep him waiting. While he waited, he thought about what Hoover might suggest. Would he send his agents to tap Clark's phones or look into his private life? We're just going in circles right now. Seems like we're not going to be able to do this one. So we'll Such see. Such a lovely place. We have something. We have something. One of the agents we've been following, Clark has reported back, and apparently that boring goody goody might not be a spot as he first appears. It seems that, like, every once in a while, he and his wife is at her parents' house. Clark's like a dress casual and drive on the down to a sleazy Columbia Heights motel. Always the same time, always the same room. Although we haven't actually caught him doing anything yet, it certainly looks unseemly. <clears throat> Even though no actual evidence. People could easily draw their own conclusions if the photos of Clark ensuring that motel were to be anonymously sent to the Washington Post. Sure, the president could possibly committing a few crimes fails a comparison. To one's entire life getting destroyed with one little photograph, maybe we should ask Clark what he thinks about this. Such a lovely face. Zvishenshaj. Well, Kennedy poured himself a double scotch sat down at the desk in the Oval Office. He exhaled and watched the liquid swirl around in the crystal tumbler. It was over he'd won. Clark wouldn't confirm about his nighttime motel business and shamelessly, shamefacedly agreed to tender his resignation and quit quiet about co until pro. It's a great victory, so why didn't he feel like one? Still, thought Kennedy just taking a sip, this meant the secret would be kept. His legacy would remain untarnished by the occasionally pragmatic things he had to do to secure it, as now he's free to continue his crusade against injustice. So what if he had to circumvent the strict law of, uh, of the law, lay of the law a few times? That was utterly criminal. After all, it was love and fair and war, after all. And the writers were determined to stand on the path of progress when they deserved to get cast down, he thought. Feeling the strange, powerful lightness of triumph rising in the chest. Now, the future of America is through the shape. Hubris returns. We did it, my friends. And I actually redid this, uh, like, re loaded the save to do it, but he who fights monsters. Power of K stood to the window of the Oval Office. Hands behind his back and looked out over the White House lawn. It was shaping up to be a beautiful day. The sky seemed bluer than normal, and the sun brighter than the clouds whispered. He felt untouchable, and now Clark was out of the picture. There's no one to stop the expansion of COINTEL Pro and his campaign and injustice could continue on to beat him. After all, a weapon is just a weapon. In the hands of a good man, it's an instrument of good. Not nobody would ever know he had done it, and his legacy as an icon of progressivism was ensured. It was perhaps a little unseemly, but it had been the right thing to do. The use of COINTEL Pro had made the world a better place. He kept telling himself that over and over and again. The President. Next day, with the satisfaction, he turned around where the guy stood. His shoulders slouched. Kenny to walk beside the, uh, behind the desk and sat down. Wonderful days, William. It's a shame to be cooped up here. I think I'll cut it early today. Take Ethel and the kids for a picnic. He started to write into the papers on his desk and go now, William. I don't have anything else to discuss. Guy gloomily turned to leave the Oval Office, feeling defeated. As he opened the door, he briefly glanced back at Kennedy, sitting contently in a sunbeam. He thought of his brother resting in peace and how lucky he was. How lucky he was not to see what became of his brother. Oh boy. Good rush militarization. Ah, it's only money. I should have just explained that to you. And I guess we can do Saturday, Sunday Night matter Massacre. So we'll see. And if we can actually elect Gene Kirkpatrick, I'll probably actually play as her, so we'll see. No guarantees, but we'll see. So we're doing a crap ton of damage here, too. Alright. Bind up our wounds. Why not? Sounds good to me. 
We don't want any wounds here. King Gabbit. The rain stops as the brown suit man pulls in the parking lot. Oh. Uh. Streets are deserted this late. No lights shine in the dreary concrete office block. The house of Little Rock's contingent of the MPP's and Nationals faction. He walks off, feet splashed in the dirty gray puzzle, and locks the door. Looking around quickly, he slips inside. The man flicks on and, uh. Small handheld flashlight makes his way through the familiar office as he passes the desk that has become his. He glances briefly at the framed photograph of his wife. Unlocking the record room with a copy key, the rifles through the boxes searching for the unmarked manila folder that is the object of his search. Pulling it out, takes a photograph of each page of the document with his little Minox camera before pulling it back in its place. It's strange, he thinks, that he makes his way back to his car without something so innocuous to have the power to change a nation. The country's scene. Or same scene plays out in a dozen other little dour offices around the country that night. The dozen anonymously recently hired employees carrying out the orders of the true employer. The following morning, at Quantico, a thousand miles distant, and Anna's eyes goes wise as she reads the documents from Little Rock. This, she thinks, is how we get them. All that remains is down to some knife. The game's begun. Blitz, blitz, blitz him. Zabal? Sure, why not? Bind up our wounds. The greatest generation. These few years saw us take risky gambles and hard sacrifices as if it sucked the feet of the pitch of madness, but at last, the performance paid off handsomely. Black Americans now see the rights granted, expand, and truly protect for the first time. Working Americans now come home every week with more money and better health than the last. Voting Americans now approach the ballot box confident that their vote voice will be heard in Congress. What? No one can fathom the fateful day in 64 has been realized in under a decade, enriching the Americans' life and freedom like never before. Through our tireless efforts, the golden age just within our reach of our nation's greatest and most blessed generation claim is theirs. More unified? A daring to dream, I guess. If we have to. There we go. And we got a circle here, which sucks. Bruh. Get the barnacles out of our way. Burning of a just man. All Robert Kennedy wanted was to make America a better place. Yet he muses, he swirled a mouthful of scotch around his mouth. He seemed like Americans didn't want liberty, freedom, or justice for all. Reflecting on the endless struggles he faced to try and reform the nation, Kennedy had come to the bitter conclusion that the average American is cruel, petty, small minded, and just above all else, afraid. Violence on the streets, pundits running on every radio and television, extremism becoming the norm. All because he tried to bring America to a new harmonious future. All because he tried to send black kids to school and reform corrupt institutions. Sure, he had to do a few dirty things to get there, but nobody ever said politics, politics was an honest man game. I think you're supposed to keep the high road if your opponents will stoop to the lowest tactics against you. The president felt another mind grain coming out, stretching around his head like an infernal coronet. Or coronet. He groaned and put his head in his hands. America was a better place, and his citizens hated him for it. We plant the seeds for fruits we won't reap, but our children will. Oh boy. A massacre, oh no. 4%. Intimidate them, fabricate stories, intimidate them maybe? I don't know. Happy December, everybody. The main goal really is to just pretty much finish out RFK's tree here, so. Good night, sweet prince. The president may revel in America's long-deserved victory against his own evils, but he does not forget the lives lost and ruined to achieve it. Among the honored dead count his brother, John Kennedy, depraved of life by a madman's barrel, he had nevertheless kept America from bleeding further after the bastard Nixon tore apart gashes at his neck. Most morally, restore faith in American democratic institutions following Nixon, overseeing what would have been a return to normalcy indeed. Many believe he would have succeeded more at a tragedy not struck as it had. 
Jack had always been a vocal believer in doing what was right. No doubt about it, he would have been proud of Bobby were he allowed to see what little, his little brother had accomplished. The president scheduled a report or short trip to his brother's resting place. What he will do there, only he seems to know. Meeting adjourned. And the next on the item, the agenda is uh, integration of Robert E. Lee Middle School. The speaker suddenly halted as the meeting hall's doors banging open. Half a dozen men in suits entered, one of them waving a piece of paper. FBI, we have warrants for the seizure of dangerous material. One of the men boomed. Stay in your seats, and the agent will be speaking with you shortly. Murmurs of concern spread around the room with, with the John Birch Society members, mostly middle class wives, who realized what was going on. What on earth are you doing, one of the uh, meeting attendees? Luis Tom Tomlinson demanded the FBI agent search this briefcase. We haven't broken any laws. The meeting of groups concerned about citizens, and we have freedom of speech in this country. Radical materials pose a national security uh, threat, sir. One of the agents replied coldly, If you love a country, sit down and be quiet. Tom Tomlinson looked into the agent's eyes and the other government men who were surrounding him as the only one to have stood up and spoken out. The shoulders drooped in seat, sat back down, staying silent. Every meeting attendee was interviewed. For many, it was their first time being interrogated by law enforcement. It's certainly the most hostile conversation they ever had to do with all 30 figures. He used to having friendly uh, ch cops chiding them. The clinical professionals and the FBI graded on them. Word of the raids spread quickly with a distaste for the John Birch Society combining had concern over the FBI's tactics. Next week's meeting has been postponed indefinitely. One last time. The ride to Arlington uh, National Cemetery was uh, becoming a familiar one of President Kennedy, of course. Yeah, he knew every bump, every stop, every turn on the road that led him to the place where he had to celebrate his greatest triumphs and dealt with the most devastating defeats. As the guards gave the familiar salute towards the President's convoy, going to the complex, he remained lost in thought, desperately trying to push away what had come to do and instead focus on the memories he had made there before. Like the night Congress passed the Civil Rights Act after having to move to heaven and earth to finally deliver the promises of America to so many and had so fallen asleep beside him, opened the sh bottle of champagne and ham. Those feelings of warmth were the only thing that powered him to get out of the car and walk over to the calling flame, but even they couldn't defeat the sense of finality. He watched over him as he stopped and finally looked towards where his brother rested. All he could do was simply stare and shiver as the memories of Fortitude were replaced by ones involving Jack, long pushed down by both the repression and the strains of government. The ferociousness of Highness Touch Football, the giddiness of him winning the VP nomination, the glow of undying loyalty as his chief of staff. He wasn't charismatic, could secure himself anymore, and with all his remaining strength, he took the note he had held in his clenched fist and laid it down next to the dancing flame. He stared at it as the feelings of utmost anger, sadness, and loss died down inside him, before abruptly walking back to the limbo. Not a word was uttered by the Secret Service as he grasped under Ethel, as memories of the old faded away and the realization that he had finally made his family's legacy whole set in. After years of fighting, scraping, and clawing, he had secured what his brother had died for, what he had fought for for every day since that horrible moment. Tears poured down his cheeks as the limousine drew away and he said goodbye to Arlington for the last time. Dusk fell. An elderly groundskeeper shuffled between the rows of headstones, tidying them, making sure they would look perfect to the families who would come through those gates in the morning. Checking on the eternal flame, he saw a piece of paper. He picked it up, unfolded it, and pondered the words of a grieving brother's soul, finally at peace. Jack, the unfinished business is done. 25% more stability. Only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. And I think that's the end of his campaign. Oh, no, hold on. The National Progressive Pact. The Women's Occupational Military Equality and Normalization Act. Oh, okay. Now yeah, that's fine, whatever. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's the end of RFK's tree. So if Jean Kirkpatrick actually does run, I'll do my best to try to get her, but we only have basic civil rights legislation. That doesn't seem very good. I guess we are not that radical. We have 7%. Poverty. Very high. National Ethics Commission. Oh boy. Uh, national Healthcare System. Oil crisis is not very good for us. Controlled markets. Imposed rationing, of course. Secure so supply lines. Swift warfare. American military advisors, which is actually pretty good. Uh, spinning cogs is alright. A new dawn is well better than uh, what we had before. Discontent for African interventions. Italy and the OFN. Troop restraintment, which is not bad either, but still. But, uh, yeah. With Democrats. We can do this stuff as well, but really I wanted to go through the entire focus tree and see what it would be like, so. Um, either way, I think I'll probably end the campaign here. Of course, it's now 1972. Um, but, so if there's anything else after this, maybe you'll see maybe tomorrow. We'll see. I don't know. But enjoy the campaign thus far. Leave a good like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. In another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great, great RFK Lack of Poverty Day.